Uh, hello, everyone. So, obviously, welcome to staff. Welcome to the Tile Conference. My name is John Hendy. I'm head of Tile. And I'm also head of the digital pedagogies at uh, Staffordshire University. So today, I just wanted to do an introduction around generative AI and some of the technologies, because what I found when I've spoken to a lot of people, as much as ChatGPT and OpenAI has been in the news, a lot of people don't really understand how it works, what it is, why it's there, or anything. So I wanted to do more of an intro se session and say about how we're approaching these sorts of things. Now, ultimately. Um, when we talk about AI, we are talking, in fact, a lot about large language models. And this is something that's been around for a long time. And there's this misnomer that people think, you know, like ChatGPT has just grown, that's it, that nothing else has come before it. So we've had this boom. It's not actually right. These sorts of things have been sitting behind the scenes for a long, long time. Um, you look at HuffPost, look at CNN, lots of the clickbaits sort of stuff. They're using these sorts of um, programs to actually churn out lots of different types of information. So these have been around, as I said, for, for ages. You'll recognize some of these. Obviously, we've got ChatGPT with OpenAI. We've got Google AI with BARD, Amazon Web Services. A lot of these have been used as chatbots. And that's what they are, is they're large language models. Now, ultimately, when we start thinking about it in this sort of terminology, it helps us understand what it actually is. So what it is, it's a predictive model, just like a big predictive text model that you have on your phones. This is the next evolutionary sort of step. It predicts the next word in a sequence. Now, this is really important for people to understand, because it doesn't love you. It doesn't hate you. It doesn't want to kill you. It doesn't want to destroy anything. It's just predicting the next word in a sequence. And so from that, it's not a paraphrasing sort of tool. We have seen them develop now into more paraphrasing, but it's not taking that information and paraphrasing around. It's actually just predicting what the likelihood of the next word is going to be. And also, it doesn't really understand what it's writing. So when it tells you that it loves you and it wants you to marry it, it, it's not true. It doesn't really understand that sort of thing. So where to get its information from? Well, it's fed large chunks of, inter of <clears throat> internet data, books, these sorts of things. I read on the news, they've just done some deal now as well uh, with journal repositories, with um, uh, writing repositories as well. So we're going to see this develop further. But the big question that you should ask yourself, whenever you sort of look at an open AI model like ChatGPT, is what has it been fed on? Because depending on what it's been fed on, it's going to depend on its limitations and its biasness. And it is biased. It is rude. It is wrong. It does happen like that. But a lot of people are under the assumption, and this is some of the things I found when I spoke to a lot of students, that what comes out of chat GPT is true. And it's the same as, you know, if they Google something, they think that's true. Well, it, it's not. Chat GPT does get things wrong. One of the big worries, which I'm going to talk about in a bit, is this new pop-up writing AI tools. And these are something that sort of come to my attention more and more over the last few weeks. And it sort of came to a head yesterday where we've, we, we found out we've got a few problems around this. Um, but yeah, at the moment, the, it's the predictive model, and that's the sort of thing that we need to consider. Now, as you know, there's 4 and there's 3.5. 3.5 is your free version. Um, it's got text-based prompts only. The referencing is quite poor. So for any academics in the room that have caught any students that's been using this to churn out an assignment, you would find that nine times out of ten, that reference that the students put in links to nowhere. It's completely fabricated. It's completely made up, and that's how we've caught them. But four is a different beast. Four is something else. So four, you can interrogate much more. It can produce accurate references. It can... Uh, review websites because it's got access through to it. It can handle an awful lot of data. And <clears throat> I don't know how much true this is. They said it is 40% more likely to be factually correct. 40% more than what? <laughs> so it's always my question back to OpenAI. But one of the things that you do need to know is obviously this is a paid model and that's the free model. But when we start looking at these, we are seeing more and more students paying for ChatGPT. They're paying for the um, for model because it is generating better types of assignments or better help for the students. One of the other cool things is image recognition. Um, so it can process and recognize images. You can upload things. It can give you a recipe from it, which is fantastic because we're going to start seeing these obviously in our fridges and our cupboards and everything else sooner or later. They probably already are. Um, but one of the great things is around accessibility because this is where OpenAI and ChatGPT can really help. It's all around this accessibility side of things. We've also started to see um, logical ideas. So you can ask ChatGPT what would happen if I snipped the strings. And they'd say the balloons will fly, away, uh, fly away. Now, from this, that means that obviously we can see that sort of logic processing coming uh, to life. 
One of the other things which I thought was pretty awesome, but also pretty terrifying, and my worry about AI is not the Terminator, everyone's going to die sort of fate. My worry about AI is something very different. And when we start looking at something like this, um, this is a, a, a software called Dragon. Now, ultimately, this is a still picture, okay? So it's a still photograph of a lion. With two clicks, you can open the, the lion's mouth, you can alter it, you can change its head shape, and AI does the rest, it rebuilds all of that in for you. Now, I know a lot of graphic designers, you know, they said, you know, these sorts of things could take days, weeks, months to actually even achieve if it was possible. This can do it in seconds, literally, as, you, as you're watching it. And it's the same as when we start looking at ups, um, up pixelating as well. We can take an image from that side to that side. Again, in a matter of seconds, you can take a graphic designer, weeks, days, whatever it may be, to actually develop these sorts of things. So this software is, again, going to change everything on Photoshop and things like that. And Dragon um, is one that's come out, and I've, I've heard that Adobe are doing a similar one, introducing AI into Photoshop uh, as well. But you can edit all the photos, and look, you can even make people smile. Ah, oh, not that nice? So the big problem that we've got with this, though, is that as we start looking at these sorts of photos, and then we start looking at artificial intelligence, and we use things like character AI, we start picking up different types of AI, how do we actually know what's true? And there's this big question now is in about, what, 16 to 18 months. How do we actually know if a video is true on the internet? How do you know if a photo is? How do you know if anything is? Because all of these things can be replicated quite quickly. And this is where my fear starts coming in, is misinformation. Because ultimately, when you start looking at these sorts of things, that's where it does get worrying. Because how can you separate what the truth is? How can you separate what fact and fiction is? <clears throat> Likewise, when it comes down to scam, if you see some of the new phishing type things that are coming out, they are phenomenal. We are talking about here where they can scan phones, they can scan emails, they can use OpenAI to generate a dialogue. This isn't something that's going to come in the future. This is, this is something that's happening now. It won't be long before they can start using photos, using videos to manipulate you. That's the way it's going to happen because they are taking these tools and building them at a massive pace. Uh, <clears throat> GPT-4 does uh, and can access websites um, when provided with a, with a prompt as well. We do have plugin developments where we're seeing um, places now taking it offline or off sites. They're actually using um, ChatGPT, like the chatbot, to actually work with their staff to, to be the front of their customer service. And this is where we started seeing the implementations. So, so we've got things like accessibility. We've seen things in learning, like the Duo Max, uh, Duolingo Max service, why things are wrong. Uh, Why well, the answer is wrong, that's all, again, powered um, by these sorts of tools. We've seen Morgan Stanley take this into knowledge base and support, where they've actually fed it all their documentation, they've trained it on their documentation, and it can serve as a front of house for staff, for customers. Fraud prevention, Stripe have done a, a very good way of doing it, and they've actually trained um, GPT on their businesses. So they've done it the other way. So the AI can actually understand their customers and it can understand then and flag things when things don't look right, when things look wrong. So we actually started seeing this now in towards, uh, moving towards things like fraud prevention. Uh, research as well, which I'll come to in a second. <clears throat> so this slide, don't worry uh, too much, we, we will share the slides. Um, this one is obviously quite lengthy. Now, all this is about is this is just about how people are actually using these sorts of things in their teaching at the moment. And it's important to note that when we start looking at ChatGPT, when we start looking at AI in teaching, there are a million different uses that we can have. But the most important thing that we, that we can do is ban it. And I've seen that around responses around the world where they said, you know, we should ban these things, we should change the things. You can't. That's not the way to do it. <clears throat> There's so many different things that ChatGPT can do to help to become your tutor support. And that's the most important. And on here, everything from personal tutors, co-designers, study buddies, we've seen them now be the third person in a discussion where they can start, you know, um, interrogating or playing devil's advocate against two people having a debate. Any of these sorts of things can happen. And that's where I think it's really quite exciting um, that we take hold of these and we start training staff on using them. Research as well. And again, when you start looking at this research approach, to me, it's very similar to a student approach when they approach their sort of assignments. It can help generate ideas, research questions or projects, suggest sources. It can search archives and data sets and it can translate them into other languages. We've got data analysis where it can code things, it can suggest patterns, suggest themes. It can help write it up. It can reformat citations, references. It can translate writing. So it can play a massive help in this, in this sort of field. And then it sort of comes to the question, 
um, which a lot of people have, is around assessments. There's always this big fear of, oh my God, that's going to write all the students' assignments for me. But that becomes very difficult because what is it that we're asking students to actually do? And when you start thinking about these um, as academics, as research people as well, what is it you would use AI for? And is it so different that we would expect our students to use it in quite similar sorts of ways? So I was chatting to an academic the other day who's <clears throat> actually getting it to do data interpretation for them and present a report. And yet they also said that if the student did the same, they would be going through plagiarism. And it seems to be the case that when we start thinking about this, we have to think about how we're using it, how the students are using it, but how they're going to be using it in the future as well. So always the first question everyone asks is, does this fall within academic misconduct? Well, for us, it's a simple yes, it does, because it's given you an unfair advantage. If you use ChatGPT to write your assignment and then submit it, yeah, that, that, is gonna, um, that is gonna be academic misconduct. The big difference is going to be is where students have then built on that information. And this is where we get a very, very blurred line. And this is something that what we decided to do was actually create some guidance around this. What is acceptable? What isn't acceptable? And at the moment, I'm doing this uh, with JISC as well. Um, JISC jumped ahead and they've created a fantastic network um, across different universities around this, around sector-led policies, student policies, staff policies. And this is some things that we're trying to do now is we're trying to get ahead because to me, I think the most important thing that we can teach students is how to use this morally and ethically. I've got um, four kids, two of those are old enough to start using ChatGPT, and they realize that 80% of the things on the internet is, is not true. They also realize that ChatGPT lies. So they don't rely on information. But the way that they interrogate that information is they find out something, they ask it some questions, then they know to go and research it. Is that true? How do you know it's true? And yeah, well, I feel sorry for my kids. They do get lectured a lot. <clears throat> so this brings us on to plagiarism. And this is, this is one of the areas that I have a bit of an issue with um, when it comes down to plagiarism. I'm not a huge fan of plagiarism detectors, personally. Um, I've bypassed them. My team have bypassed them um, quite easily, to be honest, just by adding words, changing words, messing about with it. Um, you can get around these sorts of things. But also, on top of that, if a student hasn't plagiarized, but they, the way that they classify it is on something called perplexity, if they haven't plagiarized, then you're accusing that student that they have. That's pretty sad. And imagine what that's going through for that student. So then we have to look at on the other foot. Well, actually, in all honesty, nobody's ever going to turn around and say to a student, yeah, you've definitely plagiarized, unless that student agrees, based on one of these sort of classifications. You can't do it. It's impossible. So to me, if that sort of plagiarism, plagiarism side is off, and that's something that we're not going to use, then we need to think about how students are using this. So I've gone the other way, and I've actually said to students to use it. I think it's brilliant. And I said, use it, lob your assignment question there, see what comes out. How do you know it's true? Because 90% of it would be wrong. And that's how we start bringing it into our classrooms. Because I think then if students use it, they are going to use it in the future. I'm going to use it to cut down on work, um, to my admin work. Of course I am. And I think most people would do. But it's how you use it and what you take from it. And I think a simple one, um, one of the gaming departments did was they got it to build some coding for some sites or something. And very, very quickly, they identified there's little bugs in the code. So they got the students to change these sorts of bugs. But they knew what they were looking for. And this is what I've been trying to explain to students, is chat GPT is brilliant if you know your subject backwards. Absolutely brilliant if you can spot where it's lying. It's fantastic. But if you can't, then you've got a problem. It can give you a rough idea. But like everything else that you read on the internet, that you read in the news, take it with a pinch of salt, go and do some proper research. But this will give, help structure it. It can help translate it. It can help give you some ideas around it. And that, to me, is far more important. So <clears throat> the university asked me to think about policy considerations around this. How do we develop this guidance? How do we develop policy? And this one has come up recently. Anyone heard of Quillbot? Yeah? Oh, quite a few. Well, you have now, haven't you? <laughs> After us for the last few days. Um, so Quillbot has come in where students admitted they've used Quillbot for re-paraphrasing um, information. Now, ultimately, when we start looking at this, we start looking at tools that help us. We start off quite easily with a, with a spell checker, and then we start off with a bit of predictive text. Do we say then that students can't use it because it's not their own work? Do we say it when we start looking at Grammarly? And they start restructuring, rechanging, helping format things. Or 
Do we say, well, actually, no, that's okay. But what we'll do is go one step further and use something like Quillbot. And there's like 66 of these type things. And <clears throat> with Quillbot, it re-paraphrases your stuff. So it makes it sound really good. And that's fantastic. That's great. But is it then considered an academic offence? And this is where I have an issue, because obviously chat GPT then. So you've got this sort of scope, how these things have developed. And it's only really now that we've actually turned around and said, well, do you know what? Actually, I think we've got a problem here. But where is it? Where do I put that line in and say, right, that's a clear distinction? No way. <clears throat> you can't do that. I can see a little bit of one for this if I just put in a question, print it off and submit it. I can understand that. Absolutely. Here is a much more of a grey area for me. Because say a student, <clears throat> really, really clever student, they know their area well, they just have a little bit of difficulty getting some of their points across. Is it that much to say, with a little bit of help from AI to re-paraphrase, that they've fully cheated? They've created some sort of academic misconduct? And that's where I'm really, really struggling with this. And I know other universities are too, I've spoken to an awful lot, and we're all trying to find out where this sort of line is drawn. So to me, <clears throat> I think that you, you can quite comfortably say somebody's lobbed in a question, printed, would be just the same as somebody copied and pasted from Wiki, that's fine. But I think when you're backtracking from that, I think that's very different. And this is where I think that we're going to have to produce guidance rather than very heavy regulations, because this isn't going to be the end. There's going to be more stuff that's going to keep coming after this. And that's my difficulty. I started writing some guidance in January about it when we we're on chat, uh, version three. To be honest, it, it was no good by March. It was pointless because everything changed then. So oh, no good now, is it? So I can't be bothered to keep writing and writing and writing. So I think it's more about that training element. So what we need to do is we need to think about how students are actually using this, what we want them to do with it, <clears throat> but also think about this sort of line with students. Because once you get into this end, it's very close then that we're going to start having issues with plagiarism as they get older. It's going to be copyright. We've seen test cases come into the court now. There's going to be a lot, lot more over the next six months um, that's coming around copyright issues. And it's making sure that students understand they can't use that information. It's because it could be plagiarism. It could be that somebody else is writing it, but we don't know what the source is. So it's just one to think about that line for your own institution, about where you would draw that line or what you would actually do. And for me, like I said, I'm, I'm very stuck with this at the moment. And I think it will be guidance. I think it will be training. But holding somebody to account for an academic offence around these, I think it's going to be a really dangerous game, personally. So I popped up on here um, <clears throat> just some random thoughts this morning, this was. And this was about, really, what would you actually use it for? So when you start thinking about all the different things that we get help with, predictive text, question design, research, translation, help, revision, writing up, support, structuring assignments, analyzing data, spell checking, again, where's the line? So if I'm saying to a student, really clever science student who's done a fantastic experiment, but their writing is awful. So they've got this to do, write up a report. They've done all the data correct, they've done the experiment correct, they just use this to help their writing up. Is that plagiarism? Is that an academic offense? Is, the, is that not their own work then? And to me, that's where I'm starting to have this sort of issue. Because I'm assuming that everyone here has heard of Copilot that's come out from Microsoft or seen a version of it. So Copilot's brilliant because that can convert a report um, into a PowerPoint. It can convert data sets in Excel into a report, into PowerPoint. It does it all for you with um, AI images as well. So that's, that's pretty awesome. So it can develop all these sorts of things for you. But look at the help that Word gives you now. Look at the help that PowerPoint gives you now. We're going to redesign that for you. We're going to change that for you, make it look better. How much really is this that different? So when you're considering these sorts of scenarios where you convert reports to PowerPoint, convert an Excel to report, analyze an Excel to produce graphs, and then paraphrase, paraphrase an assignment to be a bit more concise, are they really so wholly different? Or are they just sort of the same-ish thing? <clears throat> and I think that depends then on what your sort of subject is, what your area is. But I do think that considering I use all of these things to help me, I don't really think it's an, uh, you know, unfair to say, well, students should you know, use them as well, because they should. If they're going to be using them in their career moving forward, great, use them. Let's just show them how to use it properly. So I think that, uh, there is something to think about that, about how you use it, how your students are producing their assignments. And for us, one of the things that we've been <coughs> excuse me, pushing towards is authentic assessments. Because I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the essay. I'm law trained, so most of my life was writing 
essays that meant nothing that was quite boring to be honest if I ever read them back I don't, I don't think I ever would especially Ladmore my gosh but when you think about these authentic assessments what is it that we're getting students to do so <clears throat> What we've done um, as tile, academic development, careers, library, quality, registry, we've got everyone together. All right. <laughs> Sorry, five minutes. We've got everyone together and we started holding digital activation days. And these digital activation days are really important for us because it gives staff hands on help. Um, they can try all the chat GPTs, they can try all the different AIs, they can play with it. Um, they can speak to all of us in our individual departments so we can help. They can bring their assignments, their uh, lesson plans, they could bring their essays, whatever it may be, they could bring to us, um, staff are able to, and we'll help them convert it. So with careers, they can look at what the latest things in careers is, is, is happening in their area. They can ask us how they can digitise these. We can help then with making them more authentic. So there's lots that we can do. But around these digital activation days, this is where we're asking staff to think about all these things. But it also gives us a good chance to show them how to cut some corners, how AI can help with some admin tasks as well. And we start the same with students. You know, the students are having exactly the same opportunity with us now and moving in through induction. We've got all AI induction days for students on moral and ethical use of it. But students have the same opportunity as well. So what we're trying to get with students is, you know, how can you use this better? How can it help you? And it could be, you know, AI can help you with some translation. It could be that Grammarly can help you some other bits. It could be, do you know what? Actually, you need some training on research, on valid research. <clears throat> So obviously there's lots of different things um, coming in and out. Copilot is going to be a, a big one. We all know about obviously ChatGPT, there's Bard, there's Hugging Face, which is the art one, or Dali, uh, Bing Chat, U Chat. But it's going to be, all of these is just a new era. Everything's changing now. We're seeing more and more of these develop. And like I said, we did a search, was it 66? 66 different AI writing tools that we found the other day. And these are popping up because I could create one, Robin could create one by tomorrow quite easily. We just take the open AI, we can take some of the plugins, we can wrap some stuff around it, pop one out. So it's not going to be difficult, but these are not going away. AI is out of the bag now. You can forget pretty much everything else about slowing down, because it won't. It's just going to keep developing. But there is that responsibility of teaching our students to do it, that ethical and moral responsibility. So we're trying to work with schools and colleges to take that message backwards. So I said to my local school, you know, I'll happily come in, get the students to use it, teach them about internet lying to you so just be careful what you're reading um, and again national center for ai uh, with, with jisc they've they're helping develop a lot of frameworks and there's an awful lot of good research coming out from this they've been scouring internationally all the different policies um, about what other universities are doing and we're trying to compile something together as i said they're working in partnership with lots of different universities and i think that's great so those are the sorts of ones to look out for and that's the end